Support for Lab Out Loud is provided by the National Science Teachers Association. Find out more at nsta.org. You're listening to the Lab Out Loud podcast, Science for the Classroom and Beyond. Today we're talking about how to get more people to work together to do science. They needed 4,000 volunteers to collect microbes. So basically just taking a sterilized Q-tip and swabbing. Some of the people swabbed their shoe and their cell phone. So what we did was we worked to get those 4,000 samples sequenced, and 48 of those samples were compared for growth rates on Earth, and then 48 of those samples went to the International Space Station so we could see the difference in growth rates and microgravity. That's up next on Lab Out Loud, but first, I'm your co-host, Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell. And it's spring again, which gets us outside, start thinking about the world around us, and of course, stirring up those citizen science brain cells to see what we could do on our own as scientists. We've talked about citizen science before on the show. It's a great way to become engaged, whether you're a formal scientist or if you are just a a young kid wanting to contribute to science as well. And there's a great place to find opportunities to do that. Uh, It's called SciStarter, and they have a month-long celebration uh, called Citizen Science Day. That's a, It's a challenge. It's a celebration of citizen science. That's right. And to help us celebrate, we have the founder of SciStarter. Her name is Darlene Cavalier, and she's here to talk to us about all the wonderful citizen science opportunities that exist for science teachers and their students and families, a whole bunch of wonderful ways for people to get started. It's a fun time to be a science teacher and a science student uh, because I imagine that part of the challenge at least in my own experience, part of the challenge for my science teacher to keep me interested in grade school, middle school, high school, and I would even say into college, was making science relevant for me. Um, I was more interested in cheerleading and dancing, for example. Um, But I think part of that has to do with um, science being taught in a way that it's, it's sort of hard to understand, like what role you have in science. It feels like it's happening and it's great that it's happening around you. But if you don't think that you want to become a scientist, which is totally fine, um, or a policymaker or an educator, science can feel a little distant. It's something for somebody else to take care of and manage. So the reason why I think it's an exciting time to be a science teacher or a student in science right now is because we see so many opportunities now to actually do science in a way where you're shaping science. And like I said before, it doesn't matter if you don't become a science uh, a scientist yourself or an engineer, there are thousands of, literally thousands of ways that you can help advance areas of research. Simple things from sharing observations of wildlife um, to more, I would say, a little more complicated things of building your own sensor to monitor air quality um, and water quality and soil quality. I mean, the sky is the limit in terms of how deeply you can get involved in advancing areas of research. So do you find that there are different levels or ages that are appropriate for participating or contributing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's different uh, areas of expertise. It's different um, uh, amounts of time that people have to be able to commit to this. And we, we definitely recognize, like, for some, for some, it's a luxury to be able to have the time to volunteer for science projects. Um, I would say it it may depend on the level of comfort that somebody might have with a particular topic, Um, uh, comfort in terms of using the technology that's required for some of the projects, but there is absolutely, hands down, no doubt, something for everyone. All right, so I have 10-year-old kids, like uh, they're twins, and if I want to get them outside in the on the yard, out of the house, uh, I just want to get them out of, of the course. house. Is what Brian's saying? <laughs> yeah, hypothetically, <laughs> you know what might be available for them? They're, that's fourth grade. Mm-hmm. So um, there's there's fun things. Um, observing nature, kids tend to to love that one. So there's anything from an app called iNaturalist, where every observation of of um, a living thing, including plants, um, can be you just take a picture with your cell phone, you upload it. You don't even have to know what you're looking at because that community is so large that they have so many people who will be able to identify what your child just spotted. And it contributes to um, a global database of these species. So that's a cool one. You're contributing without having to actually know what you're looking at, but you learn in the process of 
what is populating your backyard? Basically, what is in your backyard? Um, NASA has a really cool project. Um, it's a global observation app, free app. Um, one project that they have that's part of that app, or what they call a protocol, is to uh, make cloud observations. And while this sounds so esoteric or so silly, like why would you be taking pictures of clouds? What happens is that they have a satellite that orbits overhead about once every three days. And the app will notify you of when that satellite is scheduled to fly over you. When it's coming overhead, you're asked to go outside. That satellite is taking pictures of the clouds from above the clouds. So when you go out and you take pictures of the clouds from below the clouds, oh, wow. you're basically ground-truthing satellite data. Huh. And this data is used to help predict floods and droughts. Um, it goes into factor soil moisture levels that are happening. Hmm. And in the process, you get to learn a little bit about, if you already know about cloud classifications, that's great. You can, you can also tell NASA about the type of cloud that you're seeing. But if, even if you don't, so for your kids that you mentioned before, um, a couple of images appear, and you're just asked to tap the one that looks most like the cloud you're looking at. And you learn what ty type of cloud you're looking at in the process, too. What was so the you name learn of while that? you're contributing to science. That's the um, NASA Global Observer app. Yeah, and you'll see. You can even look NASA Cloud app, and it, um, mm. these are free on iTunes oh, that and sounds, for Android. That sounds interesting. Um, I think you just gave some lesson plans to a few teachers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah like, especially with the time of time of year. Um, so, tell us about your website, SciStarter. Sure, SciStarter um, has more than fifteen hundred uh, projects and events that people can get involved in. Um, it's a global database. Uh, both the uh, participants and the projects are from all over the world. Um, now is an exciting time to kind of dip your toe into citizen science, in part because there's so many events, and the events are part of citizen science days, and that's a plural. That's plural <laughs> there. It's actually yeah. a month, a little over a month. It started on April 14th with an awesome city nature challenge um, that happened all over the country. And cities competed to see who can make the most observations through that iNaturalist app that I mentioned before. So who um, won? So this was really cool. You know, they had different categories. So they had a category for the most observations and they had a category for the most participants. But I'm pretty sure that Dallas won for the most observations, which is pretty cool. Dallas. But I think it was their first year involved in this too. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So go Dallas. Um, if you look at city, yeah, go Dallas. Um, if you just Google City Nature Challenge, you'll find all the stats there and all the fun things that they found. So that's that's how we kicked this off. And we being, um, that was uh, a joint partnership between Cal Academy and I think the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History. I hope I'm pron pronouncing that correctly. Um, but two gals at each one of those places really did put a lot of work into putting that event together. Next year it goes global. So super excited about that. Um, and then we have, you know, hundreds of events between April 14th and May 20th when Citizen Science Days will have its kind of grand finale in um, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And this is where um, the Citizen Science Association, it's a, it's a relatively new association to support this whole field, um, will be having their conference. And uh, May 20th is the public event where people can come to the Science Museum of Minnesota, learn about and see in action many, I think it's like 25 or so different types of citizen science projects that they can do. And we're really excited about that. So in between, there are events that will help you get trained on some of the longer term types of projects. This is something else that I think science teachers might be interested in, um, especially if they're teaching about, let's say, um, atmospheric science or, or the water cycle. There are so many projects in need of help from the public in terms of collecting data and submitting data on a more regular basis that, that um, these training sessions might be something they're interested in. There will be, um, let's see, I think they're called, hmm, I want to say something like uh, online classification, uh, transcription meetups, that's right, where people get together and they learn and spend social time together while they're actually at transcribing records from the Smithsonian and oh. also looking over and annotating images. So this is a really important 
um, part of citizen science. Sometimes this mm-hmm. is known as crowdsourcing. This yeah. is a case where a scientist might have so much data that they're not looking for you to collect more. They're asking for your help in, in classifying some of the data, anything from images of galaxies. And you're taught, on how, you're taught how to look for something like a spiral galaxy. This is something that um, Zooniverse is a platform that does lots and lots of these online types of crowdsourcing projects that people may enjoy. Um, to even something very, very important as well. This is um, a relatively new project called Eyes, as in two eyes, on ALZ, short for Alzheimer's. And what happened here is that a couple of different researchers came together, um, and uh, there is a very strong suspicion that Alzheimer's may be accelerated because of stalled blood vessels, so where blood is not moving properly through your vessel. So what they did was they used to have um, professional researchers and graduate students spend a lot of time looking through small, short videos of ultrasounds. And they could see and they could identify when blood was not moving properly. But it was taking an incredibly long time. So what they did was they put this out to the public. If you go to eyesonalz.org, you will see a very short, and I mean like 10 seconds, of a video that trains you how to spot those stalled vessels. And then you're asked to classify each of these three second videos after that that come around. And once you have an eye for this, which does not take long at all, an eye you this. can really start to spot these. Yeah, and you can just mark on that video. You kind of click, here's where I see a stall. Here's where I see a stall. And every 10 matches becomes one accurate piece of data. So it's 10 mm-hmm. times somebody has to be saying that they see the same thing. They already found that one week of the volunteer time, the citizen science time, um, as much accurate data was um, annotated as it took the Cornell researchers one year to do. Wow, wow. So that's a very exciting project, and I would love to see even more people get involved. You can form teams. So for classroom teachers, again, this is really cool because she can set she or he can set the t- um, class up in teams and they can each compete. They unlock prizes. It's definitely been oh, wow. gamified in a very positive way. Yeah. It kind, of, it kind of reminds me of the CAPTCHAs where you have to enter the squiggle letters. That's right. And, it was, and after a while, they'd That's get right. enough to confirm that this is the weird word that, couldn't, that a computer couldn't read in a book. Exactly. That's neat. Um, I like that because... I have to admit, when I hear citizen scientist, I think of someone going out and looking at birds and leaves and just go, you know, you have to get, you have to mm-hmm. have hiking boots required. So this is an example mm-hmm. um, where it's not that case. Do you have any others? Um, maybe in my area would be physics, yeah. things like that. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you one about a project that has, um, it, it has wrapped up, but it's such a cool one. And there's more of these types of projects there. Um, and so one of the fastest growing fields that we see in citizen science is about microbes and or health related projects. So um, we wrapped this one up, but this was an exciting one. So we had, um, and actually it does have a, a link back to Wisconsin. Um, we worked with UC Davis and a couple of the researchers at the Eisen lab. They wanted to collect four, they needed 4,000 volunteers to collect microbes. So basically just taking a sterilized Q-tip and swabbing, some of the people swabbed their shoe and their cell phone, and then other <laughs> people swabbed keyboards. surface areas. And keyboards, all kinds of fun things. So <laughs> um, what we did was we worked to get those 4,000 samples sequenced, and 50, no, 48 of those samples um, were sequenced in a way that they could be compared for growth rates on Earth, and then 48 of those samples went to the International Space Station so we could see the difference in growth rates and microgravity. In addition, the astronauts on the space station saw the inside of the space station so we could start to see in a built environment, so a building, are there major differences in in what we're finding. So Mm. some of the surface samples came from buildings. And in fact, Discover Magazine's team swabbed um, a surface area in their building, and that was one of the samples that was sent to the space station too. So of the 48 samples they found, 47 were pretty much identical in terms of their growth rates. One was very surprising, and I don't know the name of it, but it um, grew much, much faster in space than anybody had expected. And there's a neat um, paper coming out about this. And the uh, citizen scientist who found that microbe is cited in that paper as well. 
And a young cheerleader actually discovered an entirely new microbe by getting involved in this project. And she is also being cited in a peer-reviewed oh, wow. paper coming out. Save, so save the cheerleader, save are, the world? And we had fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's Heroes. what we can say. Yeah. yeah. I'm also seeing, like, this one grabs my attention for myself and my dad, um, uh, this Eclipse mega movie. And this is beyond, of course, the May 20th deadline because, of course, you can't just schedule Eclipse uh, you know, within this time frame. Right. But... Uh, it's asking <laughs> right. to get, uh, yeah. Tried. It's asking to get amateur photographers and astronomers to basically get uh, images of the eclipse. Um, images be, let's see, submit a practice image before the eclipse. So yeah, it's pretty cool to think about. Like that would be, yes. uh, that would be something that would catch my fancy and I, my father's too. And and I know there's other people out there that would love to try something like that. Absolutely. Obviously, that one is in August, but there's some prep time that leads up to that. They're looking for people with um, good equipment um, to get pretty high quality images coming through there. But that's a great example of a project that um, is beyond the scope of just going outside and taking pictures of birds um, yeah. or nature. So it gives you a good example. <laughs> Not that there's anything of wrong kind with of, that. <laughs> that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but you're absolutely right. Like that, when, when we first started talking about citizen science, and to, to be honest, that's actually, those were the examples that we were finding. Mm -hmm. mostly around ornithology and nature and water quality. But it is just, you know, it's not your father's old old mobile anymore, and it's not your grandma's citizen science anymore. I mean, it's pretty am amazing how fast this has changed. Now, you have a section on the website where you can um, put your information in, put where your location is, and find an event near you. I oh, yeah. pretty proud to see Highly a, recommend that. A lot by our state. And then... Um, you can also add a, an event. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So um, we're super grateful to the National Science Foundation um, and Arizona State University for helping to provide support that made it possible for us to build new tools. And some of those tools um, empower people to keep track of their contributions to, to these research projects, regardless of where you do them. So you can imagine how empowering this is for students, in fact, so teachers can now start to assign the, pro the projects that she wants, she or he wants the students to do, and then have evidence that they actually did them. So this is a big gap that existed before, because it used to be you find a project on SciStarter, you leave, maybe you did it, maybe you didn't, nobody ever knew, because you're doing it, all those projects you're usually doing on a different website. So now mm -hmm. there's ways that all of that oh. is tracked into a, um, yeah, into your dashboard. And for students, for privacy, they remain private and only linked to that teacher. So there's some really cool tools that have been built in there. So now there's evidence that the teacher has, but also for the citizen scientist, imagine how empowering this is, that you now have evidence. You basically have an e-portfolio of all the real science you've contributed to without a science degree. So we're very excited about that part. But that goes to what you were talking about before, setting up a profile and completing your settings. You tell us where you like to do projects, um, types of projects that you think you might be interested in. Going back to that Mega Eclipse movie, you tell us what kind of instruments you have, and then we match you with the best projects based on your interest and basically, the, in some cases, the instruments that you have. That's a really awesome way for the matchmaking to take place. And then you're right. I was for about anybody to say, it's, has, a, it's a little bit more than uh, you know Tinder. It's a science matchmaking. <laughs> yes. It's a dating yes, app for science. Right. <laughs> that's right wait a um, minute dating app for have, science um, <laughs> yeah, yeah there, there's I'll a there's a farmer dating app so you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right um, <laughs> the other part about <laughs> adding projects and events is very easy too so a lot of times it's not the scientist who's adding the event it might be it might be a teacher it might be a museum um educator, it might be well, anybody who's running events, basically, if it's related to citizen science, or you just want to start scheduling meetups with other citizen scientists, um, we're starting to see more of that type of programming happen happening at public libraries, for example. Oh, People yeah. are getting together. Yeah, they're sharing uh, books about a topic. Um, there are even lending libraries, so the instruments that might be needed, including telescopes, can be checked out of libraries. It's been really cool to see how Almost every single barrier to entry, these used to be big barriers. You yeah. couldn't get involved because you didn't have a telescope. You couldn't find the project, or there weren't projects. All of that is gone. And Lab coat not required. I think a more exciting time. 
That's exactly right. No goggles, no lab coat, no degree. <laughs> I think you just gave us our title. I have a, so I have an idea. Um, I'm going to take my okay. family on vacation. It's going to be, oh, well, we're going to fly to like Las Vegas. Then it's going to be a driving vacation. And I can't be the only one doing this. So would there be um, citizen science activities that would that would be great for like, you know, a driving tour of the East Coast, yes. West Coast, that kind of thing for our summer vacation coming up? Oh, yes. So we have people, there's a, an RV magazine that just did an article about um, how to basically set up your settings and your so- site starter profile to talk about where you're going to be oh. and what the type of atmosphere you're going to be, the type of environment you're going to be in so that you're prepared because some of these many projects you can't just do on the fly. So you want to be prepared. Even if it's just, you know, Ziploc bags and X, Y, Z, you just mm-hmm. want to be prepared. And so that's one thing I would recommend is just like put your locate. It's called my places. So you'd enter your places and you would say, Hey, it's, it's outdoor in nature or better yet. There's an activity. You can um, sort by the type of activity that you're interested in doing. And that might be, show me things I can do in a car. Oh, so show me yeah. things I can do while fishing. Yes. And so right off the bat, when you're talking about that cross country trip, I'm imagining that you may find value in getting involved in, there is actually a roadkill project. Yeah. <laughs> or as you see dead animals on the road. <laughs> yeah. All right. I you spy with my little eye. Well, Something all those dead. long yeah. road trips, you know, they do get, you can only do so much. So oh, spot and road. Kill. Yes. Go for the roadkill project. Two points. Yep. Pod some. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time, Darlene. This is um, this is really it, it invigorates us thinking about you know as we see everything turning green and wanting to get outside um, and doing some other citizen science. But you've also given us a lot of opportunities to also stay inside and do science as well. So thank you so much for your time, and um, we look forward to seeing what else uh, comes out in the next week or two. Great! Thank you for having me. It's been fun. For links and other information related to this episode, visit laboutloud.com. You can send us your questions and comments at laboutloud.com slash contact. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you've subscribed on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, or your favorite podcasting platform. And if you really enjoyed it, consider leaving us a rating or a review. Your feedback helps others find our show. Until next time, I'm Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell.